1985. Rothgar has just delivered his, what's usually called his homily, or his sermon, on the dangers of pride. Right? He tells Beowulf not to do what he did after he'd ruled for 50 years. He gives us that kind of chronology. He rules for 50 years. Then Grendel comes. He has 12 years of unrest while Grendel is there. And then Beowulf comes and resolves the Grendel problem. Okay? So he says, um, picking up just for a moment, at 1774, look, turnabout came in my own homeland, grief after gladness, when Grendel became my invader, ancient adversary. For that persecution, I bore perpetually the greatest heart cares. So, Hrothgar, he doesn't come out and state it overtly, but he kind of implies. Grindel comes because of what attitude did he develop after 50 years of peace and prosperity? He, Hrothgar. Okay, pride, part of it. What else? What do you tend to become when everything is going absolutely wonderfully for you? Complacent. Complacent. He thought yesterday was good. Today will be good. Tomorrow will be good. Okay? Turnabout came. In other words, what's another phrase for turnabout? What did President Obama run, out, run on in 2008? Change. Change. Okay? change came. Pretty big change, too. All right? So, turnabout came, he said. Um, and he says, When Grindel became my invader, the ancient adversary, for that persecution I bore perpetually the greatest heart cares. Thanks be to the Creator, the eternal Lord, that I have lived long enough to see that head stained with blood with my own eyes after all this strife. In other words, change came again. Right? This is why I think those lines, 175 to 188, are central to the poem. Because in those lines, the poet is suggesting those who don't look for any change, those who don't think things will change, those who think how life is now is how it will always be, those are the ones who are going to thrust their souls into hell's fires. Those who think, however that they can still seek God after the death day will be the ones who will find the Father's open embrace. So, he tells Beowulf, well done, sit down, we're going to have a party. Glad-hearted, the gate went at once to take a seat, as the wise one told him. Then, as before, a feast is prepared. Okay? The night comes, and notice, they stay in the hall. For the first night in 12 years, Hrothgar stays in the hall. Okay. Morning comes, line 18, uh, 1799, the great-hearted one rested, the hall towered vaulted and gold adorned, the guests slept within. Okay. Morning comes, and we're told 1807. Okay. Beowulf and his men want to leave. They want to go back to the land of the gates. The hardy one, 1807, ordered Prunting to be born to the son of Edgelaf. The hardy one, that's Beowulf, he ordered Prunting, which was Unferth's sword that he loaned to Beowulf to fight against Grindel's mother, he ordered it to be born back to Edgelaf. But wait a second. Did Beowulf bring Hrunting back out of the mirror? Maybe it's time for his father. Okay, yeah. Lines 1531 and following say, hold on, let me get it. Say that after Beowulf struck Grindel's mother with Hrunting, the angry challenger threw away that etched blade, etched blade, wrapped and ornamented so that it lay on the earth's strong steel edge. Instead, he what? He trusts in his strength. His strength doesn't help him. He sees the sword on the wall. He pour, pulls the sword off the wall, hacks off her head, goes, finds Grindel's body, hacks off his head, or pops the body if you want, okay? 
that sword then melts, right? So then we're told, line 1602, just before Beowulf leaves to go back out, um, not 1602, where is it? 1602 is where I'm going to pick up. The guests sat sick at heart, stared into the mirror. They wished but did not hope that they would see their Lord himself. Then the sword began, that blade, that is the sword he pulled off the wall, to dissolve away and battle icicles. It was a great wonder, blah, 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 blah. The man of the gates took no more precious treasures from that place, though he saw many there, than what? The head and the hilt. Nowhere are we told Beowulf went back and picked up Unfer's sword. Nowhere are we told Beowulf returns back through the water with the head, the hilt, and Unfer's sword. And yet, he bids Prunting be given back to Unfer. Line 1807. He thanked him for the loan, said that he'd regarded it as a good war friend, skillful in battle. The sword edges, he did not disparage. He was a noble man. Why does the poet say Beowulf was a noble man? He's not blaming Unfair for the sword not working properly. Okay? So, Beowulf speaks to Hrothgar, 1817 or so. He says, now we want to go back to Helek. Here we were honorably entertained with delight. You've treated us well. He says, if there's anything I can ever do to earn more of your affection than the battle needs I've already done, just let me know. Okay? I will be ready at once. He expands. If ever I hear over the sea's expanse that your neighbors threaten you with terror as your enemies used to do, when did they used to do that? Over 62 years ago. Because keep in mind, Hrothgar rules for 50 years of peace. And then Grendel comes. Okay? He says what? I will bring you a thousand things. Heroes to help. I have faith in Helak. Yeah, though he be young, shepherd of his people, he will support me with words and deeds that I might honor you well and bring to your side a forest of spears. What does he mean, though he be young? How young is Helak? Is he younger than Beowulf? We're never told. Okay? Again, we're never told how old Beowulf is. So when he says, though he be young, what does that suggest, though? Usually you don't describe somebody else as being young unless, unless you are what? Older. Older. Okay. So, he'll support me. If ever Hrethric, son of a prince, this is Hrothgar's eldest son, decides to come to the Gage court, he will find many friends there, far off lands, or better sought by one who is himself good. Hrothgar says, mighty God gave you those words. Thank you. The wise Lord has sent those words into your heart. I've never heard a shrewder speech from such a young man. Okay, now keep in mind, such a young man. This is Hrothgar speaking. How old is he? He's got to be at least 80. Minimum, I think. Possibly 90 or 92. Okay. So from such a young man, I know people in their late 60s who refer to me as young. I'm, I'll be 55 in January. Okay. What if Beowulf's 50? In our terminology, okay, that might be young. It's early middle age and modern terminology. In Beowulf's day, no. <laughs> so, you are strong in mind, sound in mind, Prudent in speech. Notice, strong in might, sound in mind. What does that mean? You're strong physically and you're strong mentally. Okay. Is it strong mentally? What do we mean if we say somebody has a sound mind? 
Does it mean they're a brainiac, that they're a genius? Not necessarily. They're not going insane. They're not going insane, okay? That's, okay. that's kind of the extreme. Okay, that's a good point for you. What else? Consistent. Strong-willed? Consistent. Consistent. Wise. A sound mind means somebody who doesn't immediately jump at conclusions, who doesn't immediately fly off the handle. Okay. And prudent in speech. As the wanderer says, a nobleman must be prudent in speech. That is, you don't make a boast until you know Unless you know, you can fulfill it. All right? I expect it is likely, if it should ever happen, that the spear or the horrors of war take Revel's son, that is Helak, Beowulf's king, or sickness or sword strike the shepherd of his people, your lord, and you still live. In other words, well, you know, Beowulf, if something weird should happen in the future and your king should die and you should walk out alive... Yet the gate shouldn't, could not select a better choice anywhere for king. If you will hold the realm of your king's, kinsman. Your character pleases me better and better, beloved Beowulf. You brought it about that between our peoples, the Gatish nation and the spear Danes, there shall be peace. Whoa! Hrothgar has just introduced a wrinkle to the poem. Before Beowulf came, there was a peace between the gates and the Danes. And strife shall rest. The malicious deeds they endured before. The they, the gates and the Danes. So when Beowulf and his men arrive on the shore, and the Coast Guard goes, whoa, 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 who do you think you are? And Beowulf says, we're men of the gates. And the Coast Guard says, you know, a wise person has to determine whether or not you are a doer or a mere sayer. Whether you can do the things you say you can do. What is the Coast Guard really doing there? Okay. Keep in mind, according to what Rothgar is saying here, what state are the Gates and the Danes possibly in when Beowulf and his men land? Not peace. State of hostilities, not peace. And Beowulf and 14 men land, and this guy's got to decide. Is this the first wave? Okay. And he allows them to go forward. The malicious deeds they endured before, as long as I shall rule this wide realm and treasures together. In other words, as long as I am king, from this moment on, we are at peace, Beowulf. Why? Because of what you did. Might this, big speculation here, might this have been in the back of Beowulf's mind when he tells Helak before the opening of the poem, I'm going to go kill Grindel. Might he be thinking this is the way to bring peace? between our two warring tribes. After all, what does he say? Hi, I'm Beowulf. I'm a monster killer. I've killed a tribe of giants, a race of sea monsters, a nest of trolls, essentially. Many shall greet another with gifts across the Gannet's back. In other words, Beowulf has opened a path between the Geats and the Danes. It is now safe to travel between these two lands. It wasn't before, seemingly. The ring-necked ship, ring ship shall bring over the sea tribute and tokens of love. I know these nations will be made fast against friend and foe. Okay. All, none of that was the case prior to Beowulf coming in killing Grindel. So what does Hrothgar do? He gives Beowulf even more treasure. Okay? Twelve great treasures in the hall. And he tells him, seek your people in safety. Okay? 
He gives him a kiss. Tears are shed. And we're told, uh, I'm going to skip a bunch. Beowulf leaves with his men. They come to the sea, that is to their ship. The Coast Guard is standing there, watching the boat. And notice, he does not greet those guests with insults. Okay. Who are you? Which is what he says at the beginning. He doesn't do that now. So what does Beowulf do? Line 1900. To the ship's guardian, he gave a sword bound with gold. This is referring to the hilt. The hilt is bound with gold. Okay, my family needs to stop texting. <laughs> Sheesh. What kind of sword? Just any old sword? No. We're told he gave a sword bound with gold so that on the mead benches he was afterwards more honored by that heirloom, that old treasure. That is, when the Coast Guard went to Herod and had dinner with the other things, all the other things wanted to go, ooh, can we see the sword? Right? Because it's an old heirloom. We're not told specifically, but it could be that he gives the Coast Guard the sword of hefting, the sword that Hrothgar gave him. That was Hrothgar's father's sword. All right? Could be. I'm not saying it is. So, they get in the boat. They sail back to the land of the Geats. And they're welcomed. Uh, let's see. Where do I pick up? 1925, we are introduced to Hig, who is Helak's wife. All right? And we get a little digression about her ancestry and about how prideful in such she is. We're told that line 1942, okay, that her uh, ancestor, Thrith, or Mod Thrith, depending upon which edition you're using, here it's just Thrith, okay, was a very prideful woman. She wouldn't allow any man, essentially, to look at her. Okay? And then she gets subdued by Offa. There's an 8th century king of the Mercians named Offa. He, in fact, he builds this big barrier between the land of the Mercians and the Welsh. You can still go to it today. You can walk it. It's called Offa's Dyke. It's a ditch and a wall, or essentially a mound, okay, that runs the entire length of the Welsh border, north to south. Right? Some writers, some scholars think the poem was written kind of to celebrate Offa, and that's why Offa is introduced here. It's kind of a little morsel thrown to the king. He goes, oh, that's me. Okay? That's not the Offa being referred to in the poem. Okay? This is a separate Offa, but they share the same name. Okay? So, I'm going to skip a bit and pick up with um, Fit 28. So, Beowulf with his men go across the shore. They make their way to Helak's home. Line 1967. They had survived their journey, went boldly to where they knew the protector of Earls, Slayer of Anyanthiao, the good young battle king, gave out rings in his fortress. So why is he suddenly called... Helak, the slayer of Onion Thal. Well, because he slew this guy named Onion Thal. Who is he? Okay. This is the Swedish genealogy. You have Onion Thal, who has two sons, Othra and Onala. Othera and Onola. Othera has two sons. Eanmund and Ead yields. Remember all vowels alliterate and in Germanic fashion? Most sons' names begin with the same letter as their father. Okay? Or 
They alliterate with the name of their father. So, Unferth, Edgelof, U, Ed. They both alliterate. Notice in the poem where that doesn't work. What's Beowulf's father's name? Edgethel. It's Beowulf's name. Bunny. Beowulf. Okay. His name doesn't alliterate at all with anybody else's names, really, in the poem, other than the initial Beowulf or Beowulf. Okay. So you have Onyenthal, king of the Swedes, okay. two sons. So we find out Helak is his slayer. What does that create? A feud between these two and Helak. Okay. So Poe just throws that out there. So to Helak, Beowulf's arrival is reported. Beowulf is welcome in. Line uh, 1977 and following. Then we're told 81, the daughter of Harith, this is Hid, okay, the queen, does what? She goes through the hall, she cares for the people, she bears the cup. She does exactly what Wilthiel did in the land of the Danes. Okay? This is a motif, this is a custom among the Germanic peoples. There's an entire book written by a history professor at University of South Carolina, a guy named Michael Enray, called Lady with the Mead Cup. Fascinating book. Okay? Because it looks at this motif, a woman bearing a cup of mead, in Germanic literature and in Celtic literature. He goes back to actually suggest this is an Indo-European motif. That is, this idea, this image, goes back to about 6,000 B.C., because we see it in a variety of myths. All right? It's a hard, hard book to find. It's out of print. So, Helak begins to question his companion courteously. So, Beowulf, how'd it go? Notice, Beowulf is alive. So, that kind of tells him something. How did you fare, beloved Beowulf, in your journey? When you suddenly resolved to seek a far-off strife, over the Salt Sea, a battle in Herod. Is there a tone in Helak's words? Suddenly resolved. What does the suddenly imply? He wasn't expecting it. Wasn't expecting it? What else? Kind of frivolous. Frivolous, spur of the moment. This is not the actions of a sound mind. Okay. Did you better at all the well known wall of Hrothgar? In other words, did you solve his Grindel problem? For that I see with heart care and distress. So Helak is saying that when you left, oh, I was so worried about you the whole time you were gone. And yet Beowulf said what about his coming? The wise man and the counselor said, oh, Beowulf, you ought to go take care of this Grindel problem. Why? Because you're a monster killer. And even the narrator of the poem said, the wise men said he should go. Long I implored that you not seek that slaughter spirit at all. Now, how do you justify that comment with what Beowulf and the poet said earlier? Because, contrary to you know, modern relativistic notions of truth, they can't both be true. You can't have Helak say, long I implored you not to go, and Ben will say, oh, they all wanted me to go, and have them both be true. One of them's fudging the truth here. Okay? Let the South Danes themselves make war against Grindel. That's what Helak suggested. He's their problem. Let them deal with it. I say, thanks to God that I might see you again safe and sound. Why? What's the subtext there? What did Helak, what was Helak afraid of? That I might not see you safe and sound again. All right? Beowulf, well, it's no mystery to many men, my lord Helak. The great meeting, what a time of great struggle, grin and lie, blah, blah, blah. I avenged them all. The them, previous line. 
The sorrows for the victory show theirs. Yeah, they weren't so victorious when Grindel was around. Right? I avenge them all so that none of Grindel's tribe needs to boast anywhere on earth of that uproar at dawn. Right? Why does he say it's no mystery to many men? Is he talking about the many men at Hrothgar's court? Probably. Is he talking about any other men? Might word have preceded Beowulf? Might anybody have started to spread word? What did we hear the night Grindel, the morning Grindel was killed, as the men were riding back from Grindel's mirror? You've already got poems being composed. That morning, hours after Grindel is dead. So he says, 2009, First I came there to the ring hall to greet Hrothgar. Once he knew of my intentions, he assigned me a seat with his own sons. That is, I was given a place of honor. That troop was in delight. Never in my life have I seen among hall sitters under heaven's vault a more joyous feast. In other words, man, do they know how to party. At times, the queen, the famous queen, bond of peace to the nations. Beowulf is telling us there, okay, that wealthy owl was married to Hrothgar to bring, bring peace between her nation and Hrothgar's nation. Okay. Her name, wealthy owl, means, sometimes it has a W and sometimes it doesn't, doesn't. This means foreign, and this means servant or slave. By the way, it's from this word, wow, that we get modern English, Welsh. Okay. Wales is the land of the Wallas. The foreigners. This is why the Welsh don't call themselves the Welsh. Okay. They're the Cymru, which means us. It's all it really means. Okay. So, he says, she came through the hall, urged on her young sons, gave twisted rings, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes the daughter of Hrothgar bore the ale cup. Where, where in the previous 2,000 lines have we been introduced to the daughter of Hrothgar? Nope. Never happens. Okay. Does it mean it didn't happen? No, not necessarily. Because the poet is doing what? He's focusing on particular events, particular people. And it might be in the earlier 2,000 lines. He just didn't really care about Frey Waru that much. Okay? But now Beowulf is going to focus our attention on her. Why? For a very specific reason. So... She bore the ale cup to the earls in the back. That is, wealthy all brings the ale cup to the powerful, the connected, the people up in front. Frauru brings it back to the Bernie Sanders supporters, back, back here in the back. The dispossessed, you know, the 99%. I, I heard the men in the hall call her Frauru. She is promised, and so he starts giving us a story. She is promised, young, gold adorned, to the gracious son of Frodo. You've got a footnote. The son of Frodo is Ingel, prince of the Heathobards. His attack on the Danes alluded to earlier in the poem, that is, in the prologue, about the time that Herat is opened, when the poet says, there was as yet peace between father and son-in-law. Father, Hrothgar, son-in-law, Ingeld of the Heobards. Right? We know this from other stories. So, she's promised to the gracious son of Frodo, the ruler of the Shieldings, that is, Hrothgar, has arranged this. Why? He approves the council that he might settle his share of feud and slaughter with this young woman. Okay? She's now the third woman being described as a peace weaver. Okay? We had Frith, 
in the passage discussing talking about Hig, okay, was described as a peace weaver. Okay? We had Beowulf's comment about Wealthal being a peace weaver, and now we have this comment about Freywater. Yeah, and there's Hildeberg, but it's not actually, I don't think the phrase is actually used to describe Hildeberg. Okay? So, he says to bring about peace. But seldom anywhere after the death of a prince does the steadily spear rest for even a brief while, though the bride be good. In other words, this isn't a good way to bring about peace, no matter how wonderful the bride is. Okay? And so what he says next, it's not clear whether Beowulf is merely creating a scenario or whether he's kind of prophesying this is what will happen. It may, perhaps, displease the Hedebard prince and every retainer among his tribe when across the floor following that woman goes a noble son of the Danes received with honors. On him glitters an ancestral heirloom, hard, ring-adorned, once a Hethabard treasure, as long as they were able to wield their weapons. What's he talking about? Freyoru, over here, marries Ingel. So she goes to live with him. Does she go by herself? No, she goes with her own retinue, her own body of retainers. Okay? So Beowulf is saying, here's how this is going to play out. Sometime they're going to have a feast. And a young Dane is going to walk across the hall decked out in what? Exactly. Spoils of war. An old, dead, Hethabardish uh, warrior's armor. In other words, there will have been a battle when this young guy's father killed this Hethabardish warrior. Because he killed him, he claims his stuff. He gives that to his lord. His lord says, it's yours. It gets passed on to his son. Okay? So, the son, kind of acting like cock of the walk, is strutting across this hall. Until in that deadly shield play they undid their beloved comrades and their own lives. Then an old spear bearer, that is an old warrior, speaks over his beer. So they're sitting at the table, and an old grizzled warrior, a survivor of that Danish Hethabardish battle, turns to the young stud next to him and says, Really? You see what he's wearing? It's your daddy's arm. I remember when your daddy wore that armor for the last time. Look, you're going to let him do that? He's flaunting that. He's pushing your face in it. Can you, my friend, recognize that sword which your father bore to battle in his final adventure? That is, when he was killed beneath the helmet? That dear iron, when the Danes struck him, notice it wasn't an evil, it wasn't an even battle. Those dirty, rotten Danes ruled the field of slaughter after the rout of heroes. When Withergeld fell, notice, apparently a famous Hethabardish warrior. Otherwise, why would you name him? Okay. Those valiant shieldings. Okay. How does he mean those valiant shieldings? He's not really praising them. This is dripping with irony. He's being sarcastic here. Now here, some son or other of his slayer walks across this floor, struts in his finery, brags of the murder, and bears that treasure which ought by right to belong to you. He urges and reminds him on every occasion with cruel words. Notice, this doesn't happen once. Every occasion doesn't happen twice. It happens multiple times. And it's almost like at the end of each speech, he's like, get him. Go on, get him. You know you want to. Just 
simple, simple knife thrust under the mail coat. Until the time comes that Frey will lose Thane for his father's deeds. Sleeps, bloodstained from the bite of a sword, forfeits his life. And from there, the other escapes alive. That is, the young guy who kills him because he's wearing his father's mail. The young guy flees. All right. What has he just opened up? A massive rupture in society. So that now, the heathenards want what? Fourfold ethic. Vengeance! Against whom? The queen's family. Or excuse me. The Danes want vengeance against whom? The king's family. The king's people. Okay, so you get this rip in the fabric of society. Then on both sides, the sworn, sworn oaths of earls will be broken. We saw earlier when the poet says, here as yet there was peace. The Azim Swaran, the oaths sworn between in-laws. Once bitter violent hate wells up in Ingeld and his wife love grows cooler after his surging care. Notice, Ingeld is going to turn coolly to his wife. And you can imagine, I mean, we could, we could write the script. What does he say? Why did you bring me? Why did he have to dress like that? Why did he have to flaunt you know, that material? It'd be like somebody going to the Tower of London, stealing the crown jewels, and then going to a party, party at Buckingham Palace and wearing them. Okay. Don't think the queen would take too kindly to that. So, thus I expect that the Heathenbards' part in the Danish alliance is not without deceit, nor their friendship fast. But back to Grindel. Notice, he gets sidetracked here. But back to Grindel. So that you might certainly know, giver of treasure, how it turned out the Roman wrestling, ma wrestling match. Okay, So he talks about Grindel coming. Ah, we get named, finally, the guy who was eaten by Grindel. Hondshu. The attack came first against Hondshu there. We finally learned the name of the retainer killed in section 11. The name, as in modern German, means glove. A hand shoe. It's literally what it is. Okay, Glove. So what happens? He fell first, a girded champion. Grindel was that famous young retainer's devourer. Gobbled up the body of that beloved man. None the sooner did that slayer, blood in his teeth, mindful of misery, mean to leave that empty, that gold hall empty-handed. But he tested me, grabbed me with a ready hand. And then Beowulf gives us this little detail. A glove. The old English is actually G-L-O-F. Glove. Okay. Hung huge grotesque, fast with cunning clasps. Embroidered with evil skill, made of dragon skin. Okay? So Grindel comes to Herod with a glove. Literally, it's like a bag or a sack. What does he intend to do with this glove? Yeah, or actually, he was going to put part of hand shoe in the glove, hand shoe, glove into a glove. It's Anglo Saxon humor. Okay? But, Baal says, it was not meant to be. Once I angrily stood upright. So he says, the story's too long to tell, so I'll give you the, the short of it. He escaped away, enjoyed life a little longer, went thence to the seafloor. Hrothgar gave me lots of golden stuff. There was song and joy, 2105. The aged shielding, widely learned, told of far off times. Now, we're not sure, line, this line, look at the footnote, whether the agent shielding here is Hrothgar himself took the harp and started to relate these old times, or whether the show that works for Hrothgar is an old shielding. Okay. 
So what did he do? He sang songs, he sang lays, the great hearty king. The old warrior wrapped in his years at times began to speak of his youth again. In other words, Hrothgar kind of maybe went in and out of the present, thought back of old times, kind of like somebody with dementia. I remember when I was a young man. He remembered so much. So he says, we took our ease, and then Grindel's mother came, took Asherah. Morning came, he says, I went, line 2133, that in the roaring rays, I should do a noble deed, put my life in danger, perform glorious things. He promised me reward. He says, I found her. We fought hand to hand. I severed her head with a mighty sword. I barely managed to get away with my life. I wasn't doomed yet. In other words, fate hadn't determined otherwise. He says, so that I was able to go back. So that nation's king followed good customs. How? He distributed treasure. He offered me treasures at my own choice. What does that mean? It's kind of like he said, Take your pick. This is the treasury. Okay. Which I wish to bring to you. All right, guys, haul it in. And he has the treasure brought to Helak. I have few close kinsmen, my Helak, except for you. you. How few? This is Lytrates. None. Okay. None. At this point, Right? Or possibly none. It might be that he has one other other than Eli. And keep in mind, what is Beowulf's relation to Eli? Nephew. He likes his uncle. Right? Beowulf's mother was he like sister. Right? So he brings in all the stuff. Uh, I'm gonna skip a bit. Uh, about all the treasure being brought in. And we're told, 2177. So the son of Ejthal showed himself brave, <clears throat> renowned for battles and noble deeds, pursued honor, by no means slew, drunken, his hearth companions. Okay. Why in the world would the poet mention this? He's brave, he's honorable, he never killed drunk, any of his hearth companions. Okay. A lot of scholars have written about this. The implication is, and it goes back to a first century AD writing by the Roman historian Tacitus in his little book called Germania, written about the Germans. Tacitus describes the German customs of, of the German people. Okay. And he essentially says, you know, lots of times when they're sitting around at feast or in their beer hall, they get drunk and they start fighting. And guys start killing each other. Why? What are they doing? They're comparing their swords. Yeah, my sword's bigger than your sword. And, you know, testosterone takes over. Okay? The poet is saying, Beowulf didn't get involved in that. Okay? He never killed his heart companions. What were we told about Haramod? He did drunkenly kill his heart companions. Killed them all. He had no savage heart but the great gift which God had given him. The greatest might of all mankind he held brave in battle. The implication is Beowulf only used his strength in battle. He never used it in a non-war capacity. Right? And then the poet says this. To 2183, he had been long despised. As the sons of the gates considered him no good. Nor did the Lord of the Waiters wish to bestow many good things upon him on the mead benches. The Lord of the Waiters, that's Helak. That's his uncle, the king. For they assumed that he was slothful and cowardly. Noblemen. 
So what have we just been told about Beowulf? How many of you, if any of you had a Shakespeare course, intro to Shakespeare? None of you? Okay, I don't know when I'm teaching it again. Um, Henry IV, Part One. We are introduced to Prince Hal, or young Harry, okay, who is described in unflattering terms. Why? Because he's a slacker. He spends all his time with this fat old gross man at the whorehouse and the bar, or robbing people. This is the future king of England. His father, Henry IV, thinks he's going to turn out to be nobody. In fact, at one point, he tells young Hal, I wish Hotspur, Hal's foil, had been my son, and you Northumberland's son. I wish you weren't my son, in other words. Right? It's the same motif here. The poet is essentially saying, nobody ever expected good things to come of Beowulf. Why? He was a slacker. Right? They assumed he was slothful. Reversal came to the glorious man for all his griefs. The glorious man? It's Beowulf. It's not the king of the waiters. For all his griefs? What griefs? Nobody expected anything of him. Okay, so does this help explain why when Beowulf responds to Unfair's challenge, he says... In my youth, what was when first challenge? Are you that same Beowulf who got in the swimming match, swimming contest with Brecca? Beowulf says, yeah, I was young and stupid. But then he goes on and says, and not only did I beat Brecca, you haven't heard the whole story, but I also slew a bunch of sea monsters in that particular contest. What else? Oh, yeah. I killed a tribe of giants. I slew a nest of trolls. What's he doing there? He's giving his background. Why is he killing all these things? Why does he go out and seem to seek these battles? Like young Harry Potter, he has a thirst to prove himself. Why? Well, if you're always told you're not going to amount to anything, you've got one of two choices. You can either not amount to anything, you can say, okay, fine. Or, you work doubly hard to amount to something. The protector of earls, battle-proud king, order the heirloom of Hrethel brought in, adorned with gold. No finer treasure in the form of sword. Puts it in Beowulf's lap. This is yours. So, if he didn't give half Dane's sword away, he now has the sword, kind of of the scion of the Danes, the Shieldings. He also now has the sword of the scion of the Gates. All he needs now is he likes, and he's got the, you know, the triple play, as it were. Okay? Then it came to pass, line 2200. Amid the crash of battle in later days, after Heolac lay dead, and for Hardred, the swords of battle held deadly slaughter under the shield wall. Uh, I'm going to skip it well, skip a bit. That the broad kingdom came into Beowulf's hands. Notice, line 2200 to 2208a. What do we see? Heolac dies, Heolac's son dies. Beowulf becomes king. He was then a wise king. Excuse me. He held it well for 50 winters. Add another line. And 50 years go by. Okay. So we have, we put this up. This is in that one thing I gave out. Okay. Helak, we have Herobald, Hathkin, Helak, an unnamed daughter. Who marries Edgethal and they have Beowulf. Helak marries Hug, they have a son named Hardred. 
These two apparently don't have any offspring. Okay? To just jump ahead for a moment. He's the eldest. He should be king after Grendel's death. But he's not. Because he's not alive when Grendel dies. Why? Because Hafkin accidentally kills him. Okay? In Norse mythology, there are two gods named Baldur and Huther. Baldur, Bald, Huth, Hath. Most scholars think that these names derive from this dramatic myth. Right? Huther is the one who shoots the sprig of mistletoe at his brother, Baldur, and kills him. Inaugurating Ragnarok, the end of the world. Right? So, Hapkin accidentally kills Harabal, so he's out of picture. Hapkin then becomes king. He launches an attack against Onyanthal and is killed. He becomes king. Okay? So, Elect becomes king. He launches the Frisian raid. He dies. His son becomes king. Notice the poet just kills off Harder without any additional information. Very, very quickly. We're going to get told what happens to Harder later in another digression. Okay? So, Beowulf becomes king. He rules for 50 winters. Sound like anybody else? Hrothgar rules for 50 years. Who else ruled for 50 years in the poem? Close, Grendel's mother. She held the expanse of the lake for 50 years. Okay? Until Beowulf was then a wise king, old guardian of his homeland. We don't have any idea how old he is when he becomes king. We don't know how long after Beowulf returns from the land of the Shieldings, or Danes, that he like lives. Or that after he like dies, Hardrick becomes king. And how long he reigns before Beowulf becomes king? Because Beowulf doesn't become king immediately upon the elect's death. Could be a year. For all we know, could be 20 years. Okay. So let's assume, just for a second, Beowulf is 20 years old. Right? When he goes to the land of the Danes. 20 years. Let's say Helak lives another 10 years. Helak and Hardrid both live another 10 years after that, okay, before Beowulf becomes king. So that makes him 30 years old. Now he rules for 50 years. He's 80 years old when the dragon comes. Okay? I think this is probably... Not right. I don't think Beowulf's 20 years old. I think he's probably 25 or 30. This sheer guesswork. Okay? There's actually reason to think Beowulf could be pushing 100 at this point. So, he's an old wise king, old guardian of his homeland, until in the dark nights a dragon began his reign. Sound at all similar to something we've seen before? Hrothgar rules 50 years, Grendel comes. Grendel's mother rules for 50 years, Beowulf comes. Beowulf rules for 50 years, the dragon comes. Might the poet be suggesting about a 50-year period of peace? That, you know, year 49... Maybe you need to start building up the army, sharpening your swords, getting ready for battle. Why 50? Maybe it goes back to the Old Testament. Idea of the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, what happens? Slaves are freed. Land that was purchased goes back to its original owner. Right? It's kind of the wiping clean of the slate. Maybe. Maybe. A dragon comes. A dragon began his reign, who guarded his horde in the high heaths and the stone steep barrows, steep stone barrows. The path below lay unknown to men. 
Some sort of man went inside there, found his way to the heathen whore, his hand inlaid with jewels. He got no profit there, though he had been trapped in his sleep by a thief's trickery. The whole nation knew, and all the people around him. Right? Fit 32. What did this guy do? He breaks into the dragon's hoard and he takes a cup. Why? Because this guy is a slave or a criminal. One of the two. And what does he want to do? He wants to use that treasure to buy his freedom. Okay? 22.31. There were many such antique riches in that earth hall. That is, he goes in, he sees the cup. It's a two-handled cup. He sees the cup, but he sees a whole bunch of other treasure. Notice, the guy's not greedy. He takes one piece, one piece alone. In earlier times, 2236, death had seized them all. Who's the them? The noble race that held those precious treasures earlier. In earlier times, death had seized them all, and he who still survived, alone from that nation's army, lingered there. A mournful sentry expected the same, that he might enjoy those ancient treasures for just a little while. Okay? And we are introduced to what is called, usually, the lay of the last survivor. Kind of interesting that a lot of Anglo-Saxon poetry or literature, you get this motif of the last survivor. Kind of like the book of Job. Each time his children are quote unquote attacked, what happens? One servant runs to Job and says, and I alone am escaped to tell thee. One of the greatest novels, so to speak, in American literature begins with what? Call me Ishmael. Moby Dick. Who is Ishmael? The last survivor. Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. The last survivor. Last of Mohicans. The last of the Mohicans. You know? Okay? So you get this motif that actually runs throughout English literature, but it's pretty uh, dominant in old English literature. So, what happens? This last survivor, we're told what? He's a sentry. What does the sentry do? What is the sentry's job? Keep watch. What's he keeping watch over? The loot. The treasure of the people. Okay? And we're told a waiting barrow stood in an open field near the ocean waves. New on the cape. That is, the barrow is newly constructed. What's a barrow? It's a big mound with an opening. Go to England. You see them all over the places. Okay. In fact, there's one. It's called the Long Barrow. The um, Kinnick or something like that Long Barrow. It's like 100 feet long. Okay. There are rooms in this thing. Right? So, he bore within, that is this guy, carries inside this barrow all the treasure of his people, the plate of gold. And he speaks these few words. Hold now, O thou earth, for hearers cannot the wealth of men. And Tolkien doesn't quite say this, but he kind of implies, you can almost say that is the theme of all Anglo-Saxon literature. Tolkien actually says the theme of all Anglo-Saxon literature is the death of man and all his works. Everything in Anglo-Saxon literature ultimately is about we do not last. Period. Okay? So, hold now, O earth, for heroes cannot the wealth of men. From you long ago those good ones first obtained it. That is, those good ones, those, peop those people who dug that gold and silver and those gems out of the earth did what? They took it out of the earth. And so what's he saying? I'm putting it back. 
Why? Because heroes cannot fool it. Death and war and awful, deadly harm have swept away all of my people who have passed from life and left the joyful hall. Who, who might this speaker be? Think other stuff we read. Could this be the wanderer? It easily could. I'm not saying that the bail poet is sitting there with a whole mass of literature and going, well, let's see, how can I, you know, do this intertextuality stuff? <laughs> it's not what I mean. But it fits with everything the wanderer says. Now have I none to bear the sword or burnish the bright cup. I think of that passage in The Wanderer, which I don't think I put this on the board. It, the passage was called the Ubi Sunt motif, where he says, where are now the horse and rider? Where now is the plated cup? Where now? Okay, Ubi Sunt, where are? Latin. Now have I none to bear the sword or burnish the bright cup, the precious vessel. All that host has fled. Fled? They're dead. It's not that they ran away. Now must the hardened helm of hammered gold be... It's a beautiful line of Anglo-Saxon poetry, by the way, with its use of alliteration. Hardened helm, hammered gold. Be stripped of all its trim. What's the trim? The non-gold material that is going to rust. Because gold doesn't rust. The steward's sleep who should have tended to the battle mask. So too this warrior's coat, which waited once the bite of iron or the crack of boards, molders like its owner. In other words, it rots and decays. The coat of mail cannot travel widely with the war chief beside the heroes. Harp joy have I none. No happy song. Why? Because there's no one to play the harp. Nor does the well-schooled hawk soar high throughout the hall. Nor the swift horse stamp in the courtyards. Savage butchery has sent forth many of the race of men. Okay, so what does he mean by savage butchery? Just our enemies? No, he means war. War has taken over many of the race of men. Many? This is Lytotes again. All of the race of men. So grieving, he mourned his sorrow alone after all. In other words, he's become an exile. He's an exile in his own land. Why? Because there's nobody else with him. That's what makes him an exile. He's all alone. Unhappy sped both days and nights until the flood of death broke upon his heart. That is, he died. An old beast of the dawn found that shining horde. Beast of the dawn? It's a euphemism for dragon. Okay? Found that horde standing open. He who, burning, seeks the barrows. This is where dragons live. In barrows. Okay? He who flies by night in a pillar of fire, people on earth fear him greatly. It is his nature to find a hoard in the earth where ancient and proud he guards heathen gold. Notice, heathen gold. Though it does him no good. Okay? Look at the footnote. The association of dragons and hoarded treasure is ancient and proverbial. Okay, that's not what I thought the footnote was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the him? It does him no good. The dragon. Why? Is it because he can't use it? He doesn't use it. It's hoarded gold. What are we told in terms of kings? It's the purpose of gold. And treasure. It's to be given away. It's to be distributed. What do you do? You cement relationships. You cement trust with your things. Okay, the dragon obviously doesn't have any things. You got to think of the. You got to think of a, a uh, medieval dragon, Anglo-Saxon dragon. It's kind of a glorified account. 
We're going to count with claws and fangs and fire breathing mouth. In other words, the dragon knows what about his horde? Exactly how much is there. He knows every single piece. So you come and you take one piece, and like an account, his tally doesn't tally up. Okay? So, 300 winters that threat to the people held in the ground his great treasure. The dragon comes in, and like your dog at night, you know, curls its, you know, turns around its little bed two or three times and then curls up. The dragon does that and lays there for how long? 300 years. It sleeps on its treasure. How long would it sleep if the thief hadn't come taking the cup? Until somebody disturbed its sleep. Right? Dragons don't go seeking trouble in Germanic literature. Trouble comes seeking them. Okay? You leave a dragon, you know, what's the uh, motto of Hogwarts? Never tickle a sleeping dragon. Why? Because then you wake it up. Okay? So, 300 years it lay there until one man made him boil with fear. He bore to his liege lord the plated cup, baked for peace. The hoard was looted, so what does the dragon do? The dragon comes out. When the dragon stirred, 2286, strife was renewed. Notice what that implies. For 50 years, Beowulf had what? Peace. Peace. Okay? But now, strife returns. He slithered along the stones, stark hearted. He found the enemy's footprint. Thus can an undoomed man easily survive wreck and ruin if he holds to the ruler's grace and protection. Notice, this is the narrator's version of Beowulf's comet at lines 572-73. The horde guardian searched along the ground, that is, the dragon comes out and what does he do? He sees footprints. And so he comes out and follows the footprints and then the footprints disappear. He doesn't go, oh darn, I can't find them. I think I'll go curl back up on my 5,138 pieces of silver rather than 5,139. No. He comes out, and what does he do? He circles. Okay? So look at this now from the top. Here's a mound. Here's the whole countryside. He comes out, and he does this. In an ever-increasing circle. What is he doing while he's doing this? <sighs> you know, doing Godzilla on the land. <laughs> He's burning everything. All right? Kept circling his legs, okay, but no one was there. Soon he returned to his barrel, sought his treasure. He discovered some man had disturbed his gold, and that's when he comes out again in the evening and, you know, torches everything. 2314. That hostile flyer would leave nothing the worm's warfare was widely seen as ferocious hostility near and far. He torches everything. He goes back to his hall, to his barrow. Okay. He trusted in his barrow. That is, he trusted in his walls, in his hall. Just like Grendel's mother trusted in her hall, just like Hrothgar trusted in his hall, just like Beowulf is going to trust in his hall. What happens with all of their trust? It fails them. It fails them. Okay. It's not the trust necessarily that fails. It's where they put their trust. In things that don't last. To Beowulf, the news was quickly brought that his own home, the best of buildings, had burned in waves of fire. The gift throne of the geese. His particular herat <clears throat> torched to the ground. To the good man that was painful in spirit, greatest of sorrows. The wise one 
believed he had bitterly offended the ruler of all, the eternal Lord, against the old law. Compare that with Hrothgar when Grendel comes. Are we ever told what goes through Hrothgar's mind the first night Grendel comes? Does he say, oh God, how have I offended you? Or does he say, why me? It's more of the latter than it is the former. Beowulf thinks that he has offended God. Notice, the ruler of all, the eternal Lord. Right? That is not any kind of Germanic God. That is the Christian conception of God. Though, Beowulf is not Christian. <clears throat> Against the old law. Beowulf thinks he's violated some old moral code. And therefore, God is bringing justice on him. Okay? His breast within groaned with dark thoughts. That was not his custom. Why? Because Beowulf, as some scholars have said, Beowulf doesn't have an interior life. Beowulf doesn't think. No, I mean, the poem has shown us pretty clearly so far. Beowulf has a pretty well-developed interior life. I mean, he told the whole story of Freyro. Okay. So what does it mean? He doesn't normally think. He doesn't normally concentrate on bad things. Beowulf's a, a take-charge kind of guy. He, I hate to use it. I shouldn't use it. Oh, what the hell. He's a Donald Trump of the 8th century. In other words, he's not going to do what? He's not going to focus on the past. He's going to look at the problem now and move forward. Okay? So what does he do? He ordered a wondrous war shield to be made, all covered with iron. Why not just a wooden war shield? Wooden is a typical Germanic shield, or wood covered with ox hide, multiple layers of ox hide. So why, why metal one? Yeah, <laughs> you know. He understood wood, well that wood from the forest would not help him lend him against violence. He had to endure the end of his loaned days. Okay, this is line 2342. We have over 800 lines to go. And what has the poet just done? He's told us Baal's going to die. Why? Well, everybody dies, you know, lack of suspense. He had to endure the end of his loaned days, Lana Dias, this world's life. But so did the dragon. Ah, they're going to die together in a final cataclysmic, you know, mano a draco, you know, man against mano dragon. Draco. <laughs> then that prince of rings, lord of the rings again, Scorned to seek out the far-flung flyer with his full force of men. Too much alliteration in that line. A large army. He did not dread that attack. Nor did he worry about the dragon's fire and such. Why? Because he had survived many battles, barely escaping alive in the crash of war. After he had cleansed triumphant hero, the Hall of Hrothgar. In other words, the poet is saying, after Beowulf killed Grendel and Grendel's mother, he'd survived a whole bunch of battles. And guess what? We're going to hear about some of them. Okay? Beowulf is going to start making his way to the dragon's horde, and at various points he's going to stop, like he needs to catch his breath. It was not the least of hand-to-hand -hand combats when Heolac was slain. Second reference, I think it is, to the Frisian raid. In the chaos of battle, the king of the gates, the lord of his people, in the land of the Frisians, the son of Revel, Beowulf escaped from there through his own strength, took a long swim. Yeah, several hundred miles long. He had in his arms the battle armor of 30 men when he climbed to the cliffs. He was the only one to survive this battle. So we're told, by no means did the het wear another name for the Frisians. Okay. Or a Frankish tribe associated with them. By no means did they need to exalt. Why? Because they were all dead. Few came back from that brave soldier. So, Beowulf crossed the vast sea, 
wretched, solitary, returned to his people, and Hig offered him the horde and the kingdom. Hig, the queen, she's still alive. She goes, well, Beowulf, you're mighty and strong. You should be king. She did not trust that her son could hold the ancestral seat. Why? Because he was young. Hardred was just a boy when this occurred. Okay? So she's asking Beowulf, why don't you be king? He's like, no, 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 no. Not while he's alive. So let Hardred sit in the big seat, and Beowulf says, and I'll just do this. I'll just stand behind and flex my muscles. So everybody who sees him sees me behind them. They know. Don't mess with Hardred. Okay? So what are we told? Yet he upheld him in the folk with friendly counsel, goodwill, honors, until he was older and ruled the waiter gate. How much older? Was he 10 years old when he, like, died? And Beowulf kind of acted like Prince Regent or Lord Protector until Hardred was old enough to be king? We're not exactly told. But we are told, wretched exiles, the sons of Othera, these two, okay, Anwen and Eadils, sought him out across the seas. Who do they seek out? Hardred. Over here. Okay. So, they come a-wandering. Why? They had rebelled against the Shilving's ruler, the best of all the sea kings who dispensed treasure in the Swedish lands, a famous king. Who is the Shilving's ruler, the best of all the sea kings? Wait a second. Why is he king? Shouldn't Othra be king? And if Othra is not king, shouldn't Anmund be king? Yes. If Othra is not king, Anmund should be king. So why is Anmund and his little brother Aegils, why are they refugees? Because Scar killed Mufasa. That's exactly it. Because Odala usurped the throne. He had his brother killed. Or killed him himself. Or hired somebody to do the killing. We're going to find out who exactly it is later. Okay? So, that cost him his life. That is, allowing the refugees to come in cost Hardred his life. For his hospitality, he took a mortal hurt with the stroke of his sword. That son of Helak and the son of Onyantau afterwards went to seek out his home. The son of Onyantau, him, went to seek out his home when? After he'd come over here and killed Hardred. Okay. Onla is responsible for the death of Hardred. He didn't do the sword thrust himself, however. But he's responsible. And let Beowulf hold the high throne. Who's doing the letting here? Onola. Onola. And the old English word is let. L-E-T. He let Beowulf hold the high throne. What does let mean? Allowed, gave permission to. What does that imply? Think power relationships. Exactly. That makes Beowulf essentially what? Sub beneath Onola. Does Onola have the strength of 30 men in each hand grip? Has Onola killed a bunch of monsters? No. So how come Onola has the upper hand over Beowulf? And why doesn't Beowulf prevent Onola from going back home? Why doesn't Beowulf kill him like he did in the Frisian raid? He killed everybody. The bad guys. He didn't kill his own. In the Frisian raid. The guy who killed Helak. We're going to find out a little bit later. Beowulf killed. 
how? He got him in a bear hug and squeezed him to death. Right? So he kills Helak's killer. Why doesn't he kill Hardred's killer? It's a huge question that 98% of Anglo-Saxon scholars do not want to address. I raised this issue on an Anglo-Saxon international listserv oh, back in the mid to late 90s. must be about 96, 97. I said, yeah, it seems to me Bill doesn't act all that heroically. And it was like, you know, I said Jesus wasn't the son of God to a conference of Christians. <laughs> I mean, it was incoming left and right, all right? One or two people said, you know, I think you're right about that. Okay. Look at what's said. And he let Beowulf hold the high throne and rule the gates. That was a good king. Who's the that? It's Onola that's being referred to. It's not Beowulf that the poet is saying he was a good king. Why? What does Onola do? Let's use modern English. He kicks ass. He takes what he wants. Shield shoving. Takes other people to meet benches, you know, because he doesn't have enough. And does what? Exacts tribute. Why is he going after Hardred? It's not just because Hardred allows these two to come in. It's because of the feud opened up by Hafkin. When he attacked Onyantown, which we're going to read about later. Okay. In later days, he, Beowulf, did not forget that prince's fault. How long is later days? Is this two days? <laughs> two weeks? Two months? Two years? Two decades? It's just in later days. We don't know how exactly, exactly how long. He did what? He befriended Eogils, this brother, who isn't killed. Okay? This brother does die. So you only have the younger brother alive. The wretched exile across the open sea. See, when Onola attacked Hardred, that's when Eanmund and Eogils were now here. Okay? Eanmund gets killed too. Not directly by Onola. Another guy kills Eanmund. This guy's name, the guy who works for Onola, who kills Eamon, his name is Weston. Okay. He has a son we're going to meet. His son is named Wheelof. Okay. These guys are related to Beowulf. Beowulf's going to tell Wheelof, you're the last of the Waymundings. That is his particular tribe. So, Later days, Beowulf does what? He befriended Aegils. Across the open sea, he gave support to the son of Otra with warriors and weapons. That is, he gave Aegils men and materiel to do what? To take on his uncle. Okay? He wrecked his revenge with cold, sad journeys and took the king's life. Okay? The he there is Aegils. Aegils killed his uncle. He becomes then king of the Swedes. Okay, so we put a new chart. So now we have the Swedes. And yields his king. All the others are dead. We have the Geats. And we have Beowulf. He's king. Jump to the end for a moment. Who becomes king after Beowulf? Wheelof. Wheelof, Beowulf says, you're the last of our family left alive. You see the problem? Edios, Wheelof. What did Wheelof's father do? He killed Edios' brother, who had also legally been his king. So what does Edios now have to do? Avenge his death. Win. When he's out of the picture, you think he's afraid of attacking Wheelof once Beowulf's dead? Okay. And so the son of Edgethal had survived every struggle, every terrible onslaught with brave deeds, until that one day when he had to take a stand against the serpent. 
Grim and enraged, the Lord of the Gates took a dozen men. Okay? That is literally one of twelve. Beowulf, Weedoff, and ten others. The thief who leads the way is the thirteenth man. And thus we get the title of Michael Crichton's novel, The Thirteenth Warrior, which is his take on the Beowulf story. Okay? Better novel, novel than it is film. Not a bad film, but the novel's better. Okay? So, Beowulf and these 12 men do what? They seek out the dragon. He had found out by then how the feud arose. The vessel, the cup had come into Beowulf's hands. Oh, and we'll stop there because I didn't realize it was time. Okay, not nearly as far as I wanted to be. We will finish on Thursday. <laughs>